Hello and welcome to the Media Responsibility and a Good Story debate. I'm Marianne Seacart and we look to journalists and the media to challenge authority and uncover failure, as well of course as to entertain us. But in the face of a national and now currently a global crisis, some people have argued that the media focus on challenging government, hyping drama and focusing on negative stories is irresponsible. So should the media avoid creating fear and panic in a population? And does it have a duty to put threat into context? Or should journalism just always be driven by the bigger story and bad news usually sells a great deal better than good news? Well, we've got two practitioners, journalistic practitioners here today and a politician, all of whom I think will be fascinating on this subject. Uh, David Goodhart is a journalist and cultural commentator. He's the founder and former editor of Prospect magazine and the author of A Road to Somewhere. Nick Robinson's worked at the BBC for over 30 years, including as political editor for 10 of those. And he's now, of course, one of the presenters of BBC Radio 4's Today programme. And Jess Phillips is Labour MP for Birmingham Yardley. She's a big campaigner for women's issues and she stood in the most recent Labour leadership election. So should the media avoid creating fear and panic, even at the risk of sugaring the truth? I'm going to start with Jess. I mean, I think that at the beginning of the coronavirus crisis, there was a real risk. Um, and we were all incredibly aware of trying to not cause panic, whether that was from the things that we said in Parliament or the things that were being written about. And there was an, sort of an idea of desiring trust in the government because trust in the government really mattered at the beginning of the crisis above all, almost anything but the only thing I think that needs to happen the only thing that is above that is truth and I actually don't think that you should ever try and sugar the truth for the sake of you know, if you were going to cause absolute mass hysteria, that is something that has to be managed if you're a politician. And in fact, you know, the media, they're not irresponsible. They have ethics around this issue. Um, but the truth, which it seems is very, very hard to get to quite a lot of the time and certainly has felt like that during this crisis. The truth above anything else, I think, actually eases panic if you feel like you are being informed of things, whether they are good or bad, I think that people are much less likely to panic. You start to panic when you feel people are lying to you. Um, and so I don't think that, uh, I think that the, the media have a responsibility to, to cover what is the truth. It's when they lie for the sake of, not necessarily lie, but spin a story for the sake of other, things, whether that's reputation of their favoured um, actor in, in a particular instance, um, or where, where you stick to the truth as the simplest golden thread, I think you're on the right side. Nick Robinson. Well, my starting point is always that it isn't the job of journalists to think through the consequences of what they wrote, and I deliberately do that as boldly as I can. I don't think it's our job. It's our job to try to get to the truth, to try and explain this, uh, to try and analyse, to try and hold people to account, but not to go, well, if we do that, what then? Now, the reason I use the word journalist, Marianne, rather than media is I think it's too big a concept. The BBC is a national broadcaster. You have to pay a compulsory levy in order to watch it. So yes, the BBC has some responsibilities to the country, whether it is getting us to exercise in lockdown, making sure we can get to culture, raising our spirits. There's all sorts of things the BBC has a responsibility to do morally, but that's the BBC, not the news. The news is in a different category. And I do think the news is in a different category and broadcast news is in a different category from print and what's online because we're regulated, we're obliged by law to try at least to be impartial, to be fair, to be objective and so on. But overall, I think we've always got to be incredibly careful of those people who tell us what our responsibility is because usually it's politicians who want to conflate their own interests with the national interest. They usually say that really we're at war. You've seen Boris Johnson's Winston Churchill's 
biographer do this again and again we're at war with the virus well no we're not actually at war with the virus i don't blame him for using the rhetoric but the reason he does it is so that his supporters then can then say well you're being disloyal you're being treacherous almost as if the virus suddenly has intelligence services who are listening into the Today program. When somebody's critical of what the government's doing, the virus go, ha ha, that's what we're going to do now. The <laughs> virus isn't like that. And it's also not clear even that following the scientific advice for it is the right thing to do. There's lots of different scientific advice. There are people who think we've wildly overreacted in terms of the lockdown and that lots of people will die as a result of poverty as a result of domestic abuse, as a result of other conditions not treated. So there isn't even objectively one way of determining what does cause fear that is dangerous and what doesn't cause fear. So he tells you that the media should behave more responsibly and more morally. They're usually in favour of you not doing your job. OK, David Gotart. Yeah, I mean, I... I don't think either the politicians or the media have have adapted very well to these peculiar circumstances. Um, I mean, the politicians have not been very good at sort of communicating the balance of risk. They've not been, as it were, kind of you know revealing their workings uh, as much as they should have done. I think we all have all wanted them to do. Uh, when, when I say politicians, obviously, I mean the government. Um, They've been very defensive, you know, they haven't, I mean, I think there's a, a, a huge amount to be said for kind of, you know, admitting failures. Um, but at the same time, the media too has been, um, it's been sort of typically adversarial. I mean, I, you know, obviously they should point out when things are failing, um, but exactly why they're failing is a very complicated question usually. Um, and there's been that sort of slightly kind of nanny state assumption somehow of the kind of omniscience of government and therefore that anything that goes wrong must be the fault of government. I mean, you've seen this time after time after time on the care home question. Um, and I mean, when talking about the media, I mean, I, I obviously I haven't, and none of us have been watching or reading everything. I mean, I, um, my, my main criticism of the news is I have been watching quite a lot of BBC news at six and ten and i have been really quite shocked um by what has been coming out of my tv now that may well be because i am not used to watching it um but my god it is it is it tabloid it is incredible our coverage is so over emotional i think where i think the whole country is having a sort of certainly the 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 coverage is all is sort of almost a sort of second diana moment hugely more emotional that I've, I've been watching um, to the equivalent TV news programs in France and Germany, they are miles, miles better. They are much less focused on the death cult. Um, I mean, I mean, half the program often on BBC. Cult. Say, sorry, the, the death cult. cult. I mean, half the program is about death and is about people, you know, weeping into the camera and saying, "My granny is not a statistic." I mean, we kind of know that, and it's a, you know, we know there's a lot of a tragedy around, but we want context, we want explanation, and we're getting masses of emotion. And I think it's, and it's, I think it's dispiriting. I know millions of people have just stopped watching the main news programs because it's because it's so dispiriting. Um, and I mean, I you know, I understand you know the BBC's got to try and attract youth and and all of that, but it's sort of it's straining. I mean, it. it I, I mean, and this doesn't apply. I mean, this is TV. Um, it doesn't apply to. I mean, I've listened to a bit of PM and World at One. I haven't. I have admit, I'm not a great listener to the Today program. Um, and uh, you know, even Rod Little, a great BBC skeptic, was praising World at One and um, PM in the Sunday Times today. Um, so I, yeah, I mean, I, I do think there is a real problem, um, with, with the coverage. It's not so much that they relentlessly attack the government, although they do. I mean, I, I don't mind them doing that if they're just kind of doing it intelligently, but it's sort of, you know, they just, we, day after day, they kind of repeat the same accusations from the, from the care home people. They, they never seem to kind of investigate. And so what's happened to this 3.2 billion pounds that the government you know, I mean, what can't we follow the money and find out? You know, why is it? Why is it not getting? Yeah. To the, you know, let, let's investigate a bit. Let's find out what. You know, is it? Are we too centralised? Not centralised enough? What are the kind of institutional blockages? It's so unintelligent. 
I, I think we need Nick to, to respond to all this. I know you're, you can't represent the whole of the BBC. Well, but I, as I say, it may, not apply, it may not apply to the Today programme, which I'm afraid to say I haven't been listening to, but it certainly well, applies to the main news programmes. They are, it's as if they're aimed at an eight-year-old, you know, and, and the German and French are aimed at at least a 16-year-old. Okay. Nick, what do you say to that? Well, I don't say this to be defensive, I just say it's in the interest of the debate. As it happens, we took a decision on the Today programme that our lead slot, which is the 10 past 8 slot, would be more often than not led by an interview with a scientist and not a minister. To continue watching this video, click the link in the top left or in the description below. Or visit iai.tv for more debates and talks from the world's leading thinkers on today's biggest ideas.